Hey, how's breakfast? Let's see what we got going on here. We got biscuits and gravy and bacon and fruit. We got an omelet. We got hash browns, orange juice. So you got the uh, sausage, bacon, biscuit, hash brown omelet. Need a doggy bag, you think? I don't know. Well, enjoy. We'll be checking back in on you guys here in just a second. Okay. Guys, as we begin to uh, look at life change that really uh, begins to move forward, when we talk about this, it's not just for breakfast anymore. What we're talking about is what is it really going to take for me to have a passionate, powerful life? in particular with God, but in general, too, in everything that we do. One of the things that I want to stress today is the fact that many of us believe that we are not able to have the things that our heart desires. The Bible says if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart, and most of us go, but I got this, or I got this, or I'm not able to do this, or I'm not... And you know I love books that that work with research studies. And there's a book called Outliers where Malcolm Gladwell looked at people who rose to the pinnacle of whatever their profession was, like Bill Gates, the Beatles, uh, 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 different people, uh, athletes that made it all the way to the top. And he began to look at the type of things that happened to get them to that place. And when... All of the research was done when they began to look across a large spectrum of people who made it to the top level. They did not find anyone that had such supernatural talent that they were so much better than everybody else. It's kind of like in Nashville. Musicians. We got great musicians all over the place, but you can't sling a guitar in Nashville and not hit a great musician. You can be an incredible musician and never get a break into the music business. You can be an incredible actor, and no one ever casts you. uh, You know, who gets to the top? How do they get there? And in the research, as they began to look, one of them was about hockey players in Canada. And it was interesting because hockey players in Canada, the, the guy that did the research study, actually his wife discovered this. She was looking at the roster, you know, where, you know, when you go in, they give you the, the deal with all the players' names and all that stuff. They happened to list their birthdays. And she noticed, she looked over at her husband, she goes, almost everyone has a birthday in November and December. And she goes, there's a couple of Octobers and then there's a few others scattered, but almost everyone is in, in, you know, November, December. Is that not odd? And so he began to look and began to do some research on why do they have so many hockey, professional hockey players in Canada whose birthdays were in October, November, and December. And guess what they found out? The cutoff date for hockey, when you start in the little kids, is December the 31st. So nine-year-olds who are only nine by one month or two months are paired with kids that are almost ten. And what almost invariably happens is the kids that do the best are the ones that are a little more mature that are on the backhand side of the curve. And the way that Canada works is if you do well, they promote you to one of the better teams and they kind of rank them up and they end up on the travel teams. They end up with the best coaches. And so what happens simply by your birth date, it was slanting around to where the vast majority, almost three quarters of the hockey players were all born in November and December. It had nothing to do with their basic ability to begin with. It had to do with because of where their birthday fell, they had a slight age advantage, which got them on a better team with a better coach, with more opportunity, and with more training. And it had nothing to do with their, I mean, there were other kids probably just as talented, maybe even more talented. As they looked and looked at all of the research, they said over and over, like Bill Gates. Looked at Bill Gates. When Bill Gates was going to high school, the Parent Teacher Association wanted to do something for the kids. And one of the parents at this private school that Bill Gates went to worked at a company that actually had uh, a massive computer with what they call dumb terminals. Now, what they call a dumb terminal is you can have this little thing. It looks like a computer, but it's actually talking to the big corporate computer over there. And the mothers all pitched in to get one of these little dumb terminals at 
uh, his school. There were only five of these computers in the U.S. at that time. And here's what happened. At that time, and my wife was one of these computer programmers, they had to program everything on punch cards, and you have this big box of cards, and they'd sit them down, and it would run the cards through the machine, and wherever it would bug, it would pop out a card, and then you had to take that box, pull out that card, retype the card in a way that you thought would make it work, put it back in, and it would take, and every run took about, you know, you got back in the queue, and it would take six hours. So it would take her to debug a program about a week. With a dumb terminal, you could do the exact same program and debug it within an hour or two. Bill found out that the company was not using their computers and their dumb terminals from midnight to six in the morning. So they would get out of school, go home, go to bed, they would sleep till midnight, and then they would sneak out and go over to the corporate office, and they would sit there because the guy would let them come in, and they would program all night long. The same thing happened with a guy that wrote Java, except for he was on one of the dumb terminals at the only college in America that had them, and they would only give you two hours, but he figured out how to hack it so that he could stay on it nonstop. Two of the best computer programmers are not because... They simply were smarter. It was because they had more time. They had more opportunity to do what they did. When they came out with the research, they said to get to the top of the game and to ex excel above everything takes about 10,000 hours. And the people who excel are the people who can get that much under their belt, generally, the earliest. So Bill and the guy that wrote Java had the opportunity to get that under their belt much earlier so they were ahead of the game when it came down. The hockey players who were there got it un under their belt. Now here's the thing. There are some things that we can't control, like our birthday, or whether or not we've got a dumb terminal. But the other thing that we realize is the quicker that we understand that success is not measured by a couple of people that just seem to be very talented, but any person that will truly apply themselves and work Almost all of us can be way ahead of the curve. We may not be at the top of the game, but here's the thing. We've got to be willing to put in the time. Nobody, you know, when we believe that, you know, some people are just talented, we're, we're not motivated to put in the time. And that just flat ain't true. When we understand that we need to put in the time, the next thing we've got to do is we've got to figure out what's a priority in our life. What are we going to focus on? Because we can excel at anything, but never unless we're willing to put in the time. In, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, but who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, what would make a workman ashamed? Didn't really apply themselves. Didn't work. He goes, listen, I don't want you to be in a situation to where you know things but you don't really put them into practice to where they don't really be resonate in your life. Because one of the things that we're going to look at here in just a minute is the fact that what we think does not mean that is how we will act. Our, the goal, our highest goal that we want to attain to is not what we will ever reach unless we make it a daily part of every part of our life. It's kind of like pe uh, music lessons. I took some guitar lessons. I watched an Elvis Presley movie, and I decided I wanted to play guitar. So my parents got me a little guitar, and they set me up with lessons. And I took lessons for three months, and then I got no more lessons. You know why I only got three months of lessons? Because I never practiced. Now let me explain a little something to you here. You can get three months of guitar lessons and be no better than when you first got started if all you do is go to the lesson. And every time I would go to the lesson, he would go, now, have you been practicing? A little. <laughs> he knew I had been practicing because I couldn't hardly do what he showed me the time before. And we kept going over and over and over. And finally, my parents just said, we're not going to take you to guitar lessons unless you practice. Because hearing and learning does not mean application and the ability to do anything. I can get taught and taught and taught and taught and instructed and instructed and instructed, and if it never finds a place in my life where it starts to be practiced and ingrained, I will never benefit from any of that learning. That's an important thing to do with school. It's 
especially if you're in college. I mean, you know, when I, I, I went to college while I was working as a youth pastor. And there were a whole bunch of people there going to college, and all they were doing was going to school. They never actually did what we were training to do. They never actually went. And, you know, and eventually I just thought, why are you going to all this work? I mean, why are you training if you don't have any desire to go do it? Because all they want to do is just be students for forever. They were going to get a master's and get a doctorate. I go, you're going to get a master's and a doctorate? And you've never actually gone out and done this? You've never actually gone out and taught? And it's like, you know, they just enjoyed the thought of going to class and studying and learning. But you can always hear in their questions in class, you know, they would go, I believe, you know, this would be the most helpful, you know, and everybody that did it for a living is going, are you kidding? Where, what planet are you on? Have you ever done this for real, <laughs> right? I remember Gary Allred was talking about, he went to a very prestigious uh, academic institution. And it was really good. And he enjoyed the time that he had there. But things got a little tight, and he had to pull out of that school. And so he went to night classes at UT Annex here in Nashville. And he said, when I got to the UT Annex in Nashville, he goes, it was all taught by adjunct teachers who actually worked in the profession, and they taught at night because they just loved teaching what they did in the business school. And he goes, I'm going to tell you, I went to the main university, and it was good, but the stuff they taught was incredible. And most of them started off by going, listen, if you want to read the book, you can read the book, but let me tell you how it really works. And he would begin to talk to them about how it really works. And he goes, man, I learned so much because they weren't just teaching me theory. We were talking about real-life practice. In all of our lives, almost all of us hope that on the day that character matters, we will be a man or a woman of character. But I guarantee you, if we're not a man or a woman of character every day of our life, when the big moment comes, we won't be then either. We hope that we will be able to keep a cool head when everybody else is freaking out when that tragedy happens. But if we don't deal with adversity every day with a cool head and learn and mature and grow in that, when that other day comes, we're not going to be ready then either. We all hope that one day I will be this but the only journey to this is daily discipline and walking toward it. So as we're talking today in Luke 8, 21, he said, uh, Jesus, they were saying, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus said, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and then put it into practice. There are a million people walking around saying, you know, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so or I'm so-and-so or I'm so-and-so, right? You know, I mean, you know, it, it, it takes really no effort to identify yourself with a cause. But when it comes down to the people that you really count on, who do you really count on? The people that are, that are doing it. The people that are making it happen. In Philippians 4, 9, he says, Whatever you have learned, whatever you have heard or received or, received or heard from me or seen in me, that's all teaching, isn't it? If you've seen it or learned it or heard it or received it from me, that's, I'm teaching you. He goes, then what do you do? Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I've got to learn to put it into practice. We can't just hear the word. I love that passage. Don't just hear the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says, right? Because almost, you know, and I use this illustration a lot, but it's just so real. I mean, all, almost all of us go, living on credit's a bad idea. And yet when we get right down to it, we tend to live on credit. Almost any of us, if you go, you know, what, what should you be eating? How is it over there? Is it pretty good? You need some more? Oh, are you sure? Okay. Almost all of us can tell you the things that we eat that are healthy and the things that we eat that probably aren't healthy. But what we think about healthy food doesn't make any difference if it's not what we do with our life. It doesn't benefit us. So, I want to read something to you. It says, lifetime learning is a continual process of renewal and regrowth. As you build your knowledge base from the more fundamental concepts, you will start to notice at, uh, at more advanced levels of thought about any given subject, there will be referrals to and reviews of the fundamental principles that you build upon. So those will not, be re so those will not only be refreshed, but reworked 
As new discoveries and levels of understanding are made in any field or reality. That's the reason Isaiah 20, uh, 28.9 says, uh, who, is it, uh, who is it he is trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? The children weaned from their milk? Are those just taken from the breast? For it is do and do, do and do, rule on rule, rule on rule, a little here, a little there. What is he saying? You've got to build on one process and then build another and then learn another skill and then put it on top of that one and keep moving and growing and reevaluate and then do it again and grow. That's the only way we ever come to any level of expertise in anything. In, uh, in Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, he says, I know, then I teach, is the, what I believe is here. He said, these commandments that I give you today, they're to be upon your hearts, and then impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. In other words, make them every part of of your day. When you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night. For me, I learned pretty early on with my kids that lectures do almost nothing. Right? Because they're almost always at times when everybody's at, you know, stressed out, you know, and something wrong has happened and something bad has gone wrong. Now, here's the same principle, and, and this goes across everything. If I am not probably going to be my high, reach my highest potential, if that's not who I am every single day, having a lecture in the middle of a crisis is not going to form the character in my children. That's the reason I coined the term, we have to seize teachable moments. That I go, I want to look for every single opportunity to train and to teach my children how do you do this every single day day of your life so that you'll get there. Recently with Cameron, you know, because now he's grown, you know, but you never stop talking and never stop teaching. And, you know, in, in different life circumstances he's going to, we've coined uh, this little phrase that we keep saying to each other, and that is, no matter what's going on, I will be healthy. And number two, I will treat people with respect. I said, you can't control, you know, what your other teammates are doing, what your ex-girlfriend's doing, what your, you know, your, your friends are doing. You, know, you can't control any of that. All you can do is go, I will not allow what they're doing to make me unhealthy. I am going to be the man of God that you have called me to be, and I will treat everyone, no matter whether they're right, wrong, you know, uh, you know freaked out or whatever else, I will still treat them with respect. And I've told him, I said, that is the compass that will keep you healthy and will make those other relationships healthy. No matter what happens, I am going to do what a healthy man of God would do, period. No matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter who reacts, no matter where they go, I have one goal. Be healthy and be the man that God's called me to be and then treat every other person, no matter where they are or what they're saying or what they're doing, with an, ins with a, an immense amount of respect. And I've said, if you can just keep those two focuses in your life, you'll get ahead. You will, you will gain wisdom and ground and then learn from every failure. Man, I'm telling you what, I love failure. Not because I enjoy it, it's miserable, but I learn every time. Because there's a lot of people that don't learn. That's my favorite John Maxwell quote. He said, every once in a while people say to me, well, wisdom comes with age. And he goes, nope, sometimes age just comes all by itself. <laughs> And a guy one time said, I have 40 years of experience. And his buddy said, no, you don't. You have one year of experience, but you've been doing it for the last 40 years <laughs> over and over and over again. No, at some point, I've got to learn. I've got to change. I've got to adapt. I've got to go. That didn't work. Now what am I going to do? So we have to learn. We have to teach. How's breakfast? Filling up? Got enough? Do what? Are you trying to share now? Oh, hey, don't, don't have any leftovers. Go on, fill on up. Tank up to the top. There you go. Can't do any more? Okay, hang on just a second. Hang on a second. Okay. 
Tell me about breakfast. You've, you've got a half a plate left there. We gave you more than you could digest. Is yep. that? Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. So are you full? I'm getting there. You're getting there? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to keep working on it until you're completely full, right? Not miserable, but full. No, oh, okay. Not miserable, but <laughs> full. How are we doing? You still got a pretty good bit there, too. Oh, no, it's, it's great. It's probably the best breakfast I've had so and, ready for. in so long. What am I? Oh, yeah, I'm ready for a nap. <laughs> <laughs> the best yes. breakfast you've had in so long. Right, exactly. It's pretty awesome. What do you think there, Bert? Now, Bert, you got almost a happy plate there. Oh, yeah, my place, it's, <laughs> it's, it's done, but it's okay. good. It's almost. better than oatmeal and a banana that I usually eat, so okay. it's money. Doing pretty good, then. I'm good. Okay, good meal. Best, best breakfast you've had in a long time? Like that. Good meal? Okay. I want to ask you if you would do something for me as a test after receiving this incredible, incredible breakfast. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to wait till next Sunday to have another meal because this one is so good that it could carry you all week long? Hmm. Would I be willing to? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing, but I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> okay. That's a pretty good answer. Mm -hmm. If my body could do it, I would. Yeah, I okay. I, I, I don't know, man. I, yeah, I, that's I, it. <laughs> Finally, honesty. Finally, honesty. Guys, here's the thing. It doesn't matter how great a meal you eat, it can't carry you all week. It won't get you there. And you can have the absolute greatest music teacher, and you can go to lessons every single week, and if that's all you get, there's not going to be any real life change. The message this morning is, Hey, God, why every Sunday we try to provide you with the best spiritual meal we possibly can? But if that's all you're getting, you're never going to be what you want to be or what God wants you to be. Because at the moment that you're going to need that, it can't be something I heard over here. It's got to be something I do every day of my life. And when that moment comes, it is as natural to do that response as ever. It's like when I was flying. Every time I got in that plane with that instructor, at some point in the flight, he would grab and turn the engine off. And he would go, your engine just failed. What do you do? And there was a whole checklist. Check the magnetos. Check the carburetor heat. You know, and, and go through this, this whole checklist. And every time we went up, we did it over and over and over and over again. You know why? Because if you're in an airplane and the engine stops, you freak out. <laughs> and if you hadn't done it over and over and over and over again, when the engine stops, you're going, oh crap, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to, uh, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to, where's that chart? Right, you know, and you're, why? Because it's something I was taught. It's not something that is truly part of my life, that I can do it instantly without even having to think about it. It comes Natural, naturally out of my life. The reason that I share that with you this morning is it doesn't matter whether it's a great lesson or a great meal or a great message or a great anything. If all we do is hear and learn, we will never be what we need to be. We have to hear and then we have to learn and then we have to live it. And I have a lot of people you know, who will come up to me. Uh, we, we had some, uh, some folks that got baptized over the last year, and they go, you know, I've been coming here six years, and I've just now gotten to where I'm actually letting God really change my life. And the thing about God, why is, you know, I mean, we're not going to, you know, hound you and, you know, try to force you or coerce you to do anything. But many times we go, you know, God, why do I still have all this chaos in my life? Why do I... And a lot of it is because we haven't learned. Do and do, line, rule, precept. Learn to make it a part of my life. We have great moments occasionally when we kind of try to really push it up, but do we do it consistently every day? That's the reason, one of the reasons, that I do those devotions five days a week 
that are directly reflected on what I talked about on Sunday morning, just to go, let's not lose it. Let's not hear it and then lose it. In James 1.22 through 25, and I don't have this scripture up here for you, but it is powerful. It says, do not merely listen to the words and so deceive ourselves. Do what it says. Those who listen to the word but do not do what it says are like people who look at their faces in a mirror. And after having looked at themselves, they go away and immediately forget what they look like. But those who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue to do it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in everything that they do. That's where the blessing comes, is when it becomes part of everything that I do. Jesus told a parable. It's called the sower and the seed. He said the, the kingdom of heaven is kind of like this. A sower has this great seed. And he goes out and he scatters it on his field. And he goes, and there are places in that field where there's been a lot of people walking and it's gotten really packed down and the seed falls on the top, but it never really penetrates because it's so hard. He goes, there's other places where it, it falls into some soil and grows, but instantly weeds grow up around it. And they represent the cares of life. And it said they entangled themselves and choked the life out of it. He goes, others fall on rocky places where there's not a lot of maturity or a lot of depth in their life. And even though it springs up quickly when the heat of the sun comes out because they can't, they don't have any kind of real root, he goes, it just withers and, and disappears. He said, and then the last seed falls on really good soil, rich soil. And that seed will produce 30, 60, or 100 times what was initially given in there. And I believe all of us have some of that soil in, in all of our lives. There are places where we know what God said, but the cares of the world are choking it out of our life. There are other places where we just don't have a lot of maturity. And we don't have maturity because we've never, we've never really buckled down and said, no, I'm going to get my hands on, I'm going to get a handle on this thing. I have got to stop, you know, with this deal. It's just kind of like when we did the 100% for 100 days. And one of my things was not being in the moment, not really listening to people, constantly, you know, going, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I've really got to go somewhere else, but go on and finish it up real quick. Because, you know, <laughs> rather than going, no, I am going to be here in this conversation. And I've had to do very, very uh, simple things, like whenever someone walks into my office, I have to close my laptop. Because if not, I'll continue to be kind of checking down and looking. And it's just like, I can't do that. I've got to close that thing. And then I have to look them eye to eye. And every once in a while, I'll have something on my mind, and I'll actually say this now. I'll go, you know, uh, Mark or Jen will come in. I'll go, give me one second to do this so that I can give you my complete undivided attention. It was one of those things where I go, there's a lack of maturity in my life. I cannot put, you put that stuff out and really focus. And I had to go, that is going to continue to handicap me in my life and in my relationships unless I do something about it. I've got to do it. Now, how do we get soil that might be shallow, not much depth in our life, or that place that's just ate up by care and anxiety or dysfunction? Or what? How do we do it? Well, if you're a farmer, you've got to get to plow out and you've got to tear up some ground, right? You've got to dig it out, you know, and just go, you know, we've got all this junk in here. I've got to get it out. Celebrate recovery might be the place I need to show up. <laughs> just go, you know, hey, listen, I got some hurts, some hang-ups, and some habits, and I need some people just to walk with me through this because I got to get out of here. But at some point, and, 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 you know, I actually had it written out here. I said, you know, when the VC hits the fan, I will not be who I want to be. I will be who I am day to day. So if I, who I am day to day is not who I want to be, then I've got to realize I've got to start putting in some time. It can't just be something I've heard. It can't just be something I've learned. It's got to be something I live. It's got to be something I do. And none of us goes from zero to 60 in a heartbeat. We all have to just start taking small steps. I was in my men's group, and you know, it was, it was a, one of those deals to where uh, we started talking about praying, and uh, Larry goes, uh, anyone want to open up in prayer? And it was amazing. A whole bunch of men going, 
right? You know, because <laughs> you always look at the floor when you don't want to get called on, right? Anybody ever been in school? Right? You know, <laughs> and and we had a conversation about you know I just don't feel comfortable praying out loud. And you go, I understand that, you know, because for some reason you know we don't realize that talking to God is the same as talking to each other, and we have no trouble doing that. But but feels like talking to God something different. And I said, you know, how do you get out of that? You talk to God, right? You start off exactly where you are, and you build on it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And I told him, I said, you know, if you're uncomfortable, you need to find somebody that you know would never judge you, would never criticize you, that would love you no matter what you did, and call them and say, for the next week, every day, I'm going to call you, and we're going to pray together. And I'm going to pray out loud. Why? Because i got to get over this. This is great. And, and, and I told him in the first service, I said, you know why? Prayer is not only powerful in our lives to change us, not only does it line us up with what God has, but it is the absolute best way to impact and, and, and have a positive influence on your friends. I'm telling you, the one thing that I have learned as I've walked down the road, you know, if somebody's got you know, marriage problems or whatnot, I said, well, you know, let me tell you what God's Word has to say. They're like, please, I don't need that right now. Right, you know, or you know, my pastor sitting. No, uh, I don't need all that right now. I got enough on me. You know, most people are kind of resistant. Let me tell you what: any situation, my marriage is falling apart. Why not? Try this. Go. Would you like for me to pray for you? I can either pray with you now, or I can pray later. Almost everyone that I know of always goes, "Yeah, you know, you could pray for me. I'd appreciate that." Every once in a while. You know, I, I mean, not everyone's well, but probably over half the time I'll go, would, would you like to pray right now? And they'll go, okay. And then you know what? You can tell them everything God said. <laughs> Lord, I thank you that you said that you restore the years that the locusts have eaten and the canker where you can give back those years that have been lost in this marriage. God, you said that you bind up the brokenhearted. And I pray that. For, I mean, you, you start telling them what God said. When you get done, you know what they'll say? Thank you. I really appreciate that. Always. Why? They just experienced. I told them the same thing I would have told them if I had just been talking to them. But when they felt like I was praying for them, I'm not felt like, but when I was praying for them to bless them and praying for life, they were open to hear everything I had to say. I do it with clerks and stuff too, you know. I mean, I'll be in the, in the mini market and I'll go, you know, uh, how's your day? And they go, horrible. I go, really? Why? And they'll go, you know, so and so happened. You know, and I said, I said, I'd be happy to pray for you. I said, you know, I can pray while I'm driving or, you know, I can pray for you right now. Most of them go, well, you can pray while you're driving. I'll go out and write it down, purposely show back up there the next two, in the next two days and go, hey, I've been praying for you. How's that situation going? Immediately you'll see the response where they go, well, thank you. You know, I mean, it hadn't changed very much. You know, and, and sometimes when I say, well, you know, I'll, I'll keep praying. You know, I'm just, And it's just like all of a sudden they've had this incredible positive experience. Most people don't want to be preached to, but a lot of them would love to be prayed for. One of the greatest tools that you could ever learn is get comfortable praying for people. And if you're uncomfortable praying for people, find a buddy and just go, hey, for the next couple of weeks, I'm just going to pray really horrible prayers for you and God together, but I'm going to keep doing this right now because there's no horrible prayer, right? It's not like God's going, until you can pray really good, you just need to shut up, right? Why don't you go to a school or something, right? You know? But here's the thing. I will not rise to my highest unless it's who I am day to day. And it doesn't matter whether it's a sport or job or, more importantly, whether I'm a godly man or woman. It's got to find a daily practice if it's ever going to make a difference, step by step. Guys, I would never, ever, thank you for being a part of that this morning, but I would never want you to try to go an entire week on one meal. Never want you to do that. What I'd really rather you do is every day eat something that empowers your physical body and gives you the, be at the ability to be at the very top of your game in everything you do because you're well nourished. And for all of us, that's what I would want for us in our spiritual life. I would never want us to try to make it on one meal a week. But that daily we have something that empowers our life. That's the reason, again, I do the devotions. 
They're not the end all be all. You may find you a devotional book. You may find a, a, a friend and you go every day. We just call and touch base with each other and just go, am I walking where I need to walk? Am I getting the strength? Am I in that? Or maybe we have an area that I need to work on, like me in that 100% concentration kind of thing to where I go, this is going to be something like uh, he said. Remember where he said, you know, put it on your doorpost, put it on the (laughs) the frame of your house, stick it on the bathroom mirror, you know, (laughs) wherever you got to put that thing so that you go, this is is a place where my life is going to change. And I know that it's going to have to be bit by bit, piece by piece. Do a little, evaluate, do a little more. But I've got to keep this dead focused. I've got to keep it before me. When I get up, when I go to bed at night, this has to get healthy. And then just say, God, change me. So I want to encourage you. Think about the type of things that you go, this is who I want to be. Or this is something I want to get a handle on. Maybe I want to be a better dad or mom. And I would encourage you every day, you know, find something that challenges you in your parenting. Look for those teachable moments. Say, I'm going to do every, you know, one of the things that I did was I'm looking every day for at least one teachable moment to be able to take four minutes or less kind of thing and just say, here's something I wish that my parents had told me. Or you're here, here's a, just those little nuggets to go, this is what I'm looking for. Look for areas to praise. You know, whatever it is, if it's in your job, look for that area where I can grow or I can support or I can do whatever it is. And surely don't neglect spiritually. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we know that anything that we are going to excel in has to be a daily part of every day of our life. It has to be something that we live so that no matter what storm may come in our life, no matter what calamity may fall in on us, we will be the same person because it is who we are. You said that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And whatever's in there, that is what's going to come out, especially in the pressure times. So Lord, give us the ability to uh, train ourselves well, to make the things that we want to be a daily part of everything that we do so that when those moments come, it'll be as natural as every other day of our life to walk in the place that we desire to be. Do that work in and through us, even as we trust you in the journey. In Jesus' name, amen.